Welcome to Biography. Looking back over American history, a case could be made that the most brilliant assemblage of leaders America ever had occurred at the very start of our country. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, Benjamin Franklin, they were all contemporaries. Back then, Franklin was the most famous of them all. To the rest of the world, he was America. He personified its spirit, its inventiveness. Today, more than 200 years later, Franklin's accomplishments are still remarkable. But then again, so was the man. Americans, Benjamin Franklin is remembered as a flyer of kites and storms, a quaint, somewhat eccentric gadgeteer, and the author of folksy witticisms. But in his time, he was perhaps the most internationally renowned of America's founding fathers. A man of science, a man of letters, a politician and diplomat, the son of a Boston soap boiler who, through intelligence, talent, and industry, rose to become a man who many have called the first citizen of the 18th century. An inventor, a poet, pamphleteer, and philosopher. A distinguished member of three National Academies of Science. The one-time postmaster of Philadelphia and America's first postmaster general. He established Philadelphia's first police force, fire department, lending library, and the academy which would become the University of Pennsylvania. He founded the first fire insurance company. He served as a delegate to the Constitutional Convention, helped draft the Declaration of Independence, and still stands as one of America's most effective statesmen and ambassadors. He also had his detractors. There were those who thought Franklin dangerous and untrustworthy, willing to do or say just about anything to line his pockets, win praise, or confound his enemies. The famous writer D.H. Lawrence considered him a hypocrite and fraud, a man who preached middle-class morality while indulging his private lusts. Historian Max Weber considered him the embodiment of everything despicable in both the American character and the capitalist system. But theirs is a minority view. Most see Franklin's life as an astoundingly full one. His autobiography, one of the finest in the English language, tells a rags to riches tale truer to the American dream than that of Horatio Alger. He sought success and found it. Without consciously seeking fame, he became perhaps the most famous man of his age. A man so famous that medallions and plates bearing his likeness were best sellers on two continents. And yet he was a man equally comfortable with tradesmen and kings. A man who preferred his fur cap to an elegant wig and who modestly chose as his epitaph, Benjamin Franklin, printer. Benjamin Franklin was born on January 17, 1706 in Boston the seventh child of Abiah Folger Franklin, second wife of Josiah Franklin. His father was a dyer and tallow chandler who had arrived in Massachusetts from the English Midlands 23 years before. Young Benjamin was an avid reader, and Josiah Franklin believed his son was headed for the ministry. However, the family had no money to pay for a college education. Instead, at 12, Benjamin was apprenticed to his father as a candle maker then to his brother James as a printer. The world of the print shop exposed him to new books, ideas, and writers. Two ballads composed when he was 12 and hawked on the streets of Boston were his first adventures in literature. Wretched stuff, he would later call them. When his brother began publishing the New England Courant, Benjamin developed a taste for journalism and soon began slipping anonymous essays under the shop door at night. 
secretly delighting in the praise they received from the paper's more prestigious contributors. He wrote a version of the Lord's Prayer, which he thought was superior in style and in theology to, to the one in the Bible. He uh, rewrote the Book of Common Prayer and uh, published uh, a limited number of, of copies of it. He, uh, he invented a, a, a parable on persecution, uh, which he uh, used to uh, fool his friends with by uh, telling them that it was uh, one of the chapters of the Bible, which of course they had never heard of. The precocious 16-year-old had developed his prose style by copying the essays of The Spectator, Britain's leading literary magazine, published 14 of these anonymous pieces under the satiric pen name Silence Do Good, a chatty, moralizing widow woman. The secret of his authorship wasn't revealed until 55 years later in his autobiography. Trapped as an apprentice and bristling under his brother's stern hand, Benjamin ran away, telling a ship's captain that he needed to get out of town discreetly, having just gotten a girl in trouble. It was a lie, but it did the trick. After a miserable layover in New York, the 17-year-old Franklin arrived in Philadelphia in October of 1723, hungry, bedraggled, friendless, and almost broke. Deborah Reed, the girl who would seven years later become his wife, laughed out loud when she first saw him on the waterfront. Exhausted and looking for a resting place, he stepped inside the Quaker meeting house and, unfamiliar with the Quaker's form of silent prayer, promptly fell asleep. He soon landed a job as a printer's assistant, and through an amazing stroke of luck, a letter written to his parents explaining where he was and why he had left happened to be read by Pennsylvania's governor, Sir William Keith. The governor was so impressed with the letter's style, he made a personal call on the boy at Samuel Keimer's shop and proposed setting him up as an independent printer. Sir William, it turned out, made many promises but kept few. Sent to London to buy new type and make contacts, Franklin arrived on Christmas Eve, only to find that the governor had not provided the promised letters of credit or introduction. Stuck, Franklin took work at the only trade he knew. For two years, he lived frugally, annoying beer-sodded co-workers with his sobriety, impressing employers with his diligence, and supplementing his income as a swimming instructor. On the ship back to Philadelphia, the 20-year-old wrote out what amounted to a life plan its precepts featured frugality, honesty, industry, and diplomacy. The twelfth of his uh, virtues was chastity. He showed the list to a Quaker friend in Philadelphia who told him that he had uh, omitted one very important uh, virtue, namely humility. Humility never presented a problem for Benjamin Franklin. Within two years of his return, Franklin and a fellow apprentice founded their own press to publish Philadelphia's first top-notch newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette. It was an immediate success. The press flourished, producing, among other things, America's first medical treatise, Samuel Richardson's Pamela, the first novel to be printed in America, and the province's paper currency. Firmly established as an entrepreneur, he renewed his courtship of Deborah Reed. He had begun this courtship just before his ill-fated trip to England, but Deborah had rejected him. In his absence, she had married another who had then abandoned her. This time, however, she accepted. On September 1st, 1730, Benjamin and Deborah Franklin announced their common-law marriage. They moved into rooms above the print shop on Market Street. They also adopted Franklin's illegitimate son, William the product of what Franklin would later describe as an ungovernable youthful passion which led him to frequent intrigues with low women. Two more children followed. Sally, a lifelong joy. And Francis, dead at six, a lifelong source of grief.